High-speed train service made its debut in the United States today with the maiden run of Amtrak's Acela Express. The trains will run from Washington to New York to Boston. The new Acela Express can hit speeds of up to 150 miles per hour, but riders say it's more than just speed, as everything from TVs to beer on tap. The seats are softer, the windows bigger, everything seems more refined. With a year of record airline delays, overcrowding, strikes, and customer complaints, the time seems right for Amtrak to strike. To find out if Americans are finally ready to embrace rail travel, now available at 150 miles per hour. In the year 2000, Amtrak introduced its first true high-speed rail service. While it didn't quite measure up to similar networks around the world, the Acela Express could still claim the title of the fastest train in North America. But it was only a few years earlier that Amtrak had no experience with high-speed trains. So how did they get here? Our story takes place in the Northeast Corridor, the most heavily traveled rail route in the United States. It spans more than 450 miles between Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, and Boston. While portions of the route dated back to the 1800s, the Northeast Corridor had remained incredibly busy throughout the 20th century. The route was electrified between Washington, D.C. and New Haven, Connecticut allowing faster electric trains to cut down travel times for commuters. Penn Central took a big step toward higher speed rail when they launched their Metroliner service in 1969. These electric train sets ran between Washington, D.C. and New York at over 100 miles per hour in daily service. When Amtrak was formed a couple of years later in 1971, they took over the Metroliner service and improved upon it in the coming years. Meanwhile, some other high-speed train concepts were tested in the Northeast Corridor. Penn Central had begun testing two UAC turbotrains in 1969. After Amtrak took over, they kept them in service until 1976. A few years later, Amtrak leased two diesel-powered LRC train sets from Canada. These were trialed in America from 1980 to 1982, but Amtrak declined to keep them at the end of the lease. Meanwhile, the more traditional Metroliner service had continued to be very successful with commuters, and by the mid-80s, it was reaching speeds of 125 miles per hour. Of course, this paled in comparison to what was happening in other countries around the world. Japan had been running at Shinkansen bullet train network since the mid-60s, and their trains were now operating up to 170 miles per hour. The French TGV network had launched in the early 80s, reaching speeds over 180 miles per hour. These and other systems around the world had been developed from the ground up with completely new infrastructure. By this measure, the United States was decades behind the curve. Amtrak wanted to introduce a true high-speed service by the end of the 90s, but they knew that building a completely new rail network was unrealistic. Amtrak's president said, They are so incredibly expensive, I don't think any will be developed anytime soon. When you're talking about billions of dollars of investment, that kind of money just doesn't come out of the woodwork. For this reason, their high-speed trains of the future would need to be compatible with the century-old Northeast Corridor. Fortunately, some big upgrades would soon be underway. Over a billion dollars was being spent to electrify the northern section of the corridor between New Haven and Boston. When completed, Trains would no longer need to switch to slower diesel power in New Haven. Instead, a new high-speed service could run the entire route, cutting more than an hour off the travel time. But Amtrak had no hands-on experience with the kind of high-speed trains used in other countries. If they were going to build a new fleet of their own, they would need to gain a better understanding of the technology. In November of 1991, Amtrak announced a partnership with the Swedish State Railways 
and Swedish firm Asea Brown Bavari, or ABB. The country would land one of its high-speed trains to the U.S. for several months of trial runs in the Northeast Corridor. The train itself was called the X2000. It had debuted in Sweden a year earlier for the route between Stockholm and Gothenburg. Much like the Northeast Corridor, this route was older and had lots of sharp turns that weren't traditionally suited for high-speed operation. But the X2000 was designed for this exact setting. Using onboard computers and hydraulics, the train would automatically tilt to lean into curves. This reduced centrifugal forces for passengers, allowing the train to take corners at higher speeds while keeping the ride comfortable. The concept of tilting trains had been around for years. Most earlier attempts were plagued with mechanical issues, but the X2000 had perfected the technology. Combined with this, it also had flexible wheel sets that would fit to the shape of curves. This reduced wear on the wheels and made the ride even smoother and quieter. We have excellent railroad Washington, New York, but we wanted to recapture a lot of the air shuttle market. And to do that, we wanted to run Washington, New York in a quicker time. And we were interested in the X2000 because it would allow us to use this right away more efficiently. Uh, it's one thing to do 135 miles an hour, it's another thing to do it quietly, comfortably, and let passengers either use their computer or write memos at this kind of speed. The train sent to America would comprise six cars. At the head was a locomotive with 4,300 horsepower, making the train capable of up to 155 miles per hour. Following this would be two first-class coaches, a bistro car, and two more first-class coaches. The rear coach had a driver's cab to allow the train to be operated in both directions. It would keep its original blue, gray, and black paint scheme from Sweden, but Amtrak logos would be applied throughout. On the morning of October 20th, 1992, the X-2000 arrived at the Dundalk Marine Terminal in Baltimore, Maryland. Soon it would be assembled and put through its paces on American rails for the first time. From November 1992 to January 1993, Amtrak took the X-2000 on numerous test runs throughout the Northeast. Most of these tests took place on the Keystone Corridor in Pennsylvania, between Philadelphia and Lancaster. During this phase, one of the passenger compartments was turned into an onboard laboratory. This allowed engineers to monitor the train's performance in real time. Politicians, members of the press, and other VIPs were invited on some of these test runs. Amtrak wanted to demonstrate the train's capabilities to help generate media coverage and political support for the project. The sleek European train caught attention everywhere it went, and it certainly provided some unique photo opportunities. With the months of testing being a resounding success, Amtrak was soon ready for the next phase of the X2000's visit. While equipment testing was certainly important, Amtrak was also very interested in gauging passenger feedback. The X2000 would be put into normal Metroliner service for the next three months, starting on February 1st, 1993. Commuters would have the unique opportunity to ride the train on daily round trips between Washington DC and New York City. While the speed limit on the route was 125 miles per hour, Amtrak was allowed to run the train at 135 in regular service. But the increased speed was only part of the experience. The train's onboard amenities were a big step up from what commuters were used to. The entire train had deluxe first-class seating. The bistro car offered snacks, drinks, and a variety of meal options, including meals served to passengers at their seats. Business travelers can make use of an onboard telephone and fax machine. There were even private glass partitioned rooms to hold business meetings. Unsurprisingly, the public feedback on the X2000 was overwhelmingly positive. The Philadelphia Inquirer said, What impressed us most was the smooth ride. At speeds topping 100 miles per hour, glasses remained upright with their contents barely jiggling. If this is rail travel of the future, 
We're making our reservations now. The only real complaint about the train was its European-style seating arrangement. The Baltimore Sun said, Most of the seats are configured to face each other in pairs. Swedes are comfortable with staring at strangers, but Americans are taught that staring at a stranger could cost you your life. However, these complaints were few and far between, and the X2000 successfully wrapped up more than three months of revenue service on May 7, 1993. But its time in America was far from over. With its resounding success in the Northeast, Amtrak now planned to take the train on a promotional tour across the United States. What's more, they announced that a second high-speed train would soon be tested in the Northeast Corridor. Amtrak had considered test driving a second high-speed train for several months. Their plan was to take the best features from both designs and combine them into the specifications for their future American fleet. In May of 1993, Amtrak announced it was partnering with German rail operator Deutsche Bahn and German firms Siemens and AEG. Together they would ship an Intercity Express, or ICE, to the United States for a trial period of several months. The ICE had launched in Germany a couple of years earlier in 1991, linking Hamburg, Munich, and Frankfurt. As the country's first true high-speed rail service, it was immensely successful and considered one of the finest networks in Europe. Under the hood, though, the ICE was quite different from the X2000. It was far more powerful, clocking in at nearly 13,000 horsepower. This made it capable of over 170 miles per hour. Since the ICE didn't use tilting technology, it would need to slow down for curves. But the idea was that it could accelerate back to its top speed much more quickly. And the method they used was what I call the brute force method. The ICE is a high horsepower train set that does not tilt, but that goes on pretty much straight track at high speed. And that, that's the other approach. You can take the X2000 approach, use existing road beds, tilt, or build new straight track, not tilt, but high speed. On June 29, 1993, the ICE arrived in the port of Baltimore. The train sent to America comprised eight cars. One locomotive was situated at each end. There was a first-class coach, a restaurant car, and four second-class coaches. The train kept its original white and red paint scheme from Germany, with the addition of Amtrak logos throughout. Shortly after its arrival, the ICE was put through test runs in the Northeast Corridor throughout the month of July. Meanwhile, the X2000 was finishing up its greatest journey yet, its national tour of the United States. While the Northeast Corridor was America's only viable route for high-speed rail at the time, there were numerous other routes that were proposed to be built across the country. To help drum up support for these projects, Amtrak would bring the X2000 and ICE to dozens of cities and give people a first-hand look at what their future might hold. The general public would only get to see the trains on static display, but local politicians and members of the press would be invited to ride along on short day trips. But since the National Rail Network wasn't electrified, the trains couldn't run under their own power. While touring some areas of the Northeast, the X2000 would be towed by two of Amtrak's old turboliner cars. But it would be towed across most of the country by two F40PH locomotives. The day after it finished revenue service, the X2000 kicked off its national tour on May 8, 1993, with stops in Providence, Rhode Island and Boston, Massachusetts. Two days later, it was taken to Elmira Heights, New York, to visit ABB's American Manufacturing Plant. From here it continued north to Buffalo, where it made a round-trip demonstration run to Rochester and Syracuse. It then headed farther east to Albany, making round-trip runs down to New York City and up to Ticonderoga. The X2000 made its next public appearance 500 miles south in Richmond, Virginia. This was followed by a tour of North Carolina, 
with stops in Raleigh, Greensboro, and Charlotte. The next day it traveled another 650 miles down to Orlando, Florida. After going on display on Memorial Day, it traveled west to Tampa. It soon continued down to West Palm Beach and Miami. A few days later it came all the way back up for its last stops in the state, in Jacksonville and finally Tallahassee on June 10th. After touching base again in the Northeast, the train set off for the next leg of its tour in the Midwest. On its way through Pennsylvania, it made a tour stop in Harrisburg. Then it traveled 700 miles westward to Chicago, Illinois. Over the next couple of days, it visited Joliet, Bloomington, and Springfield, and finally St. Louis, Missouri on June 19th. After another stop in Chicago, it headed eastward to Kalamazoo, Michigan, on its way to Detroit. Then it was back to Chicago one more time before heading out of the Midwest, stopping in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and St. Paul, Minnesota along the way. Next on the itinerary was a nearly 1,800 mile trek out to the Pacific Northwest. The X-2000 went on public display in Seattle for Independence Day. From here it made demonstration runs up to Bellingham, Washington and down to Portland, Oregon. It then traveled farther south and made visits to Salem and Eugene. With that, it continued south out of Oregon for 500 miles into California. The train went on display in Sacramento, and then made demonstration runs out to Merced and Fresno, and Oakland and San Jose. On its way to Southern California, the train took the route along the Pacific coast, making stops in San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and finally Los Angeles on July 15th. After this, the X-2000 headed back east. The final leg of the trip would take it to several cities across Ohio, starting with Cincinnati. It traveled north through Columbus and up to Cleveland, and then west out to Toledo. From here the train made its way out of the state for its last official tour stop in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on July 22nd. The X-2000's US tour was a resounding success, so much so that it caught the attention of Canadian officials. They were studying the feasibility of a high-speed route of their own. And so, through a partnership with Canadian Pacific Railway, they invited the X-2000 to take a brief tour of Eastern Canada as well. Once again, the train was hauled up to New York State, this time crossing the border at Niagara Falls on July 27th. Its Canadian journey began with a run out to Windsor, Ontario. From here it ran back north to Toronto and Ottawa, and then Montreal, Quebec. The train made its final tour stop in Quebec City on July 31st, and was returned to the U.S. shortly thereafter. In total, the X-2000's tour comprised about 20,000 miles. It passed through 31 U.S. states and two Canadian provinces over the course of nearly three months. While the train had certainly earned a break, Amtrak put it back into Metroliner service just a few days later, where it would carry commuters for another two months. After its final service day on September 29th, the X-2000 had been running on American rails for nearly a full year. It was soon shipped back home to Sweden in the fall of 1993. A few months earlier in July, as the X-2000 was finishing its national tour, the German ICE was completing its testing phase. It would soon embark on a national tour of its own, although the itinerary would be considerably shorter. The train would be towed across the country by two F-69 PHAC locomotives. These experimental units had been built in 1989, and were developed in part by Siemens, the same manufacturer as the ICE. While they had previously worn standard Amtrak colors, the two locomotives were repainted in the same white and red paint scheme as the ICE itself. The train kicked off its national tour on August 6, 1993, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. From here it traveled to Harrisburg and Philadelphia. It then ran down the Northeast Corridor for a tour stop in Washington, D.C., before making its way back north to New York City. This stop in New York was especially noteworthy, as it lined up with the X-2000's commuter schedule that same day. The two trains ended up on adjacent platforms, 
marking one of the only known times they were ever seen together. From here the ICE continued north to Albany, New York. It then headed west, stopping in Toledo, Ohio, and Detroit, Michigan. After arriving in Chicago, Illinois on August 16th, the train made a round-trip demonstration run to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It then traveled 2,200 miles directly to California, reaching Los Angeles on August 25th. From here it ran north to San Jose, Sacramento, and San Francisco. Then it traveled back down to Los Angeles, and then continued down for a round-trip demonstration run between Oceanside and San Diego. Over the next couple of days, the train made its way back east, traveling over 2,700 miles through the southern states. Its next official tour stop was Orlando, Florida, where it spent Labor Day weekend. From here it headed back north, stopping in Raleigh, North Carolina and Richmond, Virginia. The ICE then passed up through the Northeast Corridor to make tour stops in New Haven, Connecticut, Boston, Massachusetts, and Portland, Maine. Curiously, the final days of the tour took place back in the Midwest. The train made its way back to Chicago, where it made a run down to St. Louis, Missouri for its final tour stop on September 21st. In total, the ICE's tour comprised over 13,000 miles. It passed through 31 states over the course of about a month and a half. It was now time for the ICE to be put through its paces on the Northeast Corridor. Following the success of its national tour, the ICE was placed into Metroliner service on October 5, 1993. Jack, look what's coming! Wow, that was cool! You know what I think we just saw, Jack? No, what? I think we just saw the future. While passengers had praised the X-2000 for its smooth ride, some noted that the ICE was a little more rough, since it couldn't tilt into corners. But with its luxurious interior design, many riders agreed that the ICE was in a league of its own. First class passengers had electrical outlets, TV screens, and stereo music at each seat. There were several private suites in addition to the standard seating. And riders could use an onboard photocopier, fax machine, and telephones. The restaurant car offered full course meal service and seating for dozens of people. It was hard to find flaws in the train's amenities, but there were some hiccups here and there. During an earlier trip, a writer for the North County Times said, I settled for orange juice on this trip, since the waiter couldn't seem to get the computerized coffee machine to work. He called for a conductor in frustration, exclaiming that he couldn't work the machine since the instructions were in German. More broadly though, some people questioned whether the ICE really made sense for America. The train couldn't reach its full potential without completely new rail infrastructure. The same kind of infrastructure that no one in the country was prepared to build. Despite this, it consistently received high praise from its riders. On December 17, 1993, the ICE made its last public run in the Northeast Corridor. It was soon returned to Germany after five and a half months in the United States. With both European trains now departed, Amtrak's real work began. Based on the information they had collected over the last 15 months, they began working up the specs for what they wanted to see in their own high-speed fleet. Their primary requirements were a fleet of up to 26 trains that could reach 150 miles per hour. These would need to meet the strict US standards for crashworthiness. They would also need to have active tilting technology to handle the curves of the Northeast Corridor. And to comply with the Buy America Act, most of the manufacturing would need to take place within the US. Naturally, the two primary contenders for the contract were ABB from Sweden and Siemens from Germany. Both companies were backed by additional partners that would assist with the stateside manufacturing. Other companies showed interest in the contract, but the one that posed the biggest threat was the Canadian firm Bombardier. 
The company had never built any high-speed trains before, but they had a partnership with GEC Alstom, the manufacturer of the highly successful TGV trains in France. Bombardier owned the North American rights to the technology, and they were confident this could win out the contract. In fact, the company already had an established relationship with Amtrak. Bombardier had built the LRC train sets that had been tested 15 years earlier. And much more recently, they had manufactured two of Amtrak's newest coach fleets, the Horizon and Superliner II. To compete with ABB and Siemens, Bombardier and Alstom revealed their concept for a high-speed train of their own. This would be a US variant of their French TGV, called the American Flyer. The three competitors submitted their contract bids in November of 1995. A few months later, on March 15, 1996, Amtrak announced the winner. Bombardier was selected to build a fleet of American Flyer trains, despite being the only contender not to showcase their product in person. A few years went by as the trains were manufactured and tested. In the meantime, Amtrak unveiled their new brand for the upcoming service, naming it the Acela Express. After years of numerous delays, the Acela service made its first VIP run on November 16, 2000. It was officially opened to the public a month later. In the years following, it would help Amtrak's Northeast Corridor become more successful than ever before. Today, more than two decades after their introduction, the original Acela trains are reaching the end of their service life. Alstom is building the second generation fleet, called the Avalia Liberty, which is again based on a French design. These are slated to begin service in 2022. While the X2000 and ICE both missed their chance to be adapted for the US market, they still left an important legacy. They served as Amtrak's gateway into high-speed rail. They showed Americans a new kind of modern technology they had never seen before. And if nothing else, they were certainly some of the most unique equipment to ever grace American rails.